you would remain standing, please turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 if you can. And our text today is Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. Philippians 4, verse 6 through 9. Hear now God's holy word. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And this is God's word. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this week we're going to look at a passage that deals with anxiety and the anxiety that we all encounter from time to time, perhaps even daily in our lives. It's a topic that I think all of us can relate to in some tangible way. But although today's passage does address anxiety, and it it also speaks to many fundamental truths about how a Christian should live, regardless of his or her situation or circumstance, whether you're anxious or not, habitually or daily, Paul is, is trying to preach and share about how we are to live beyond that. So how should Christians not worry, not be anxious all the time? What does Paul encourage us with if we desire to live free from, perhaps some of you will share, the shackles of anxiety? How should a Christian cope with anxiety? What what does the Bible say about how to live no matter what new situations arise? Because I think at the core of today's passage and sermon is not how the Christian reacts to the next new stressor or circumstance that makes us anxious, but rather, how are we to always live in the new way, in the new life? Because this passage is meant for the everyday path that we're on. And so I hope this informs you, but I hope this passage encourages you and edifies your walk with the Lord. So let's begin, going back to verse 6, and the first of three headings is, Don't worry, be prayerful. Don't worry, be prayerful. So again, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul is stating to these believers in the city of Philippi, don't trouble yourself with worrying about the future or even your present situation that is just out of your control. It's similar to what Jesus himself said in Matthew 6 25 you don't have to turn there but I'll read that Jesus said therefore I tell you do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing now Jesus isn't saying don't feel guilty if you bought a delicious meal or bought some decent clothes but the point is why worry about those things why care more about those things than your spiritual life and so Paul, piggy, you know, piggybacking off of that, saying, do not be anxious about anything. It's a command. This is not advice. It's a command. It's not something that Paul is saying, hey, this worked for me over the last two years. I wrote a helpful book. It's going to help you cope with stress, and it's coming out in Barnes & Noble next week, pre-order. But he's simply urging them, look, you believers in Christ, there is no need to worry Okay, so he's commanding the believers not to worry, but he also gives them the way out of worrying and being anxious. And that's a relief to me even as a preacher and as a teacher of God's scripture. I don't want to have to be able to figure it out myself. I want the Bible to tell me. Isn't that a wonderful blessing from God? That the Bible explains how we are to be right with God. That's justification by faith of Christ alone. How we are to grow in community. That's the blueprint in the Bible, loving one another in the spirit-led life. And now here, even combating, debilitating at times, anxiety. 
So it's, the Bible is, is not a coach yelling at a, let's say, a nine-year-old kid who's never played baseball before, and, he, and the coach says, get on the mound and pitch a strike. And the nine-year-old is just looking up to him saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. But the Bible is the exact opposite. The Word of God that is eternal shows us the way. Not just principles, but application on how we are to live. So for Paul, how do we combat being anxious? Do not be anxious about anything, but everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He states in that in order to combat worry and anxiety, it's not rocket science. He says, talk to God. Present your concerns before the living Lord. But don't miss this. Do this with thanksgiving. And studying the Bible long enough, perhaps maybe for some of you decades, maybe some of you it's the first year, the first month, and you'll, you'll begin to see this when you read all of Paul's letters, which is most of the New Testament, you'll start to pick up what? You'll start to pick up on the theme of thanksgiving that is littered throughout his writings. Paul includes the attitude of thanksgiving because he knows that That is the attitude one must have when talking with God. Instead of being rather childish with God in your demands, when one prays with the attitude of thanksgiving, he or she is reminded of the goodness of God and that God is in control of his or her life and that we have access to Christ all the time. Paul is basically screaming through the letter, don't you understand, don't you see, can't you uh, 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 comprehend this wonderful truth that you have access to God. You can talk to God. And nobody here in this room can qu- claim quicker or greatest access to God. I, I think I remember my, my, one of my favorite professors at Trinity, D. E. Carson, that said, when one is united in Christ, everyone has that same instantaneous access to God. And so think about that. Think about the godliest person you've ever met. You have the same immediate access as they do. Think of the most upright, gospel-centered, mature Christian you've ever met. You have the same access as that person. You know, there were some viral social media posts several weeks ago about people being uber upset at celebrities getting special access to favorite amusement park rides. Some of you guys might have seen that. But my friend was posting in our chat room just how livid she was that these celebrities would have to make all these average U.S. citizens just kind of wanting to go get on a roller coaster or a ride. Again, I would never do that. But, you know, to say, Oh, we're going we're gonna to stop the whole section of this amusement park because so-and-so is here with her two children. And then everyone would just have to stand back and just watch, and nobody could ride even in the, you know, there's a lot of seats, right? But no, it just has to be that family. And my friend was so upset about that. Well, with God, he doesn't tell heaven to, hush, hush, Billy Graham is praying to me or Charles Spurgeon. But when weak in the faith, so-and-so prays, well, the Father tells you, wait in line. Not so. You have access to the Heavenly Father, the creator of all things, the creator of the universe, and he is willing and lovingly ready to listen to your prayers immediately. And so what, what anchors Paul and the Philippian believer is exactly what he states in chapter 3, verse 20 through 21. Again, you don't have to turn there, but let me read it real quickly. Right before this passage, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That's the foundation Church in Philippi, church in Elgin, that's the groundwork for our obedience and the command not to be anxious. Because Paul is saying even 2,000 years later, because our already citizenship in heaven has been bought, sealed, it's a done deal because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
in his life, death, and resurrection. And this is, this is also why Paul says, rejoice, right, right the, the verses right before this, rejoice, I'll say it again, rejoice. Because this is our context. This is our backdrop. This is not self-help. This is because we are united to Christ. You do not need to be anxious any longer. So this knowledge then, allows them to pray and talk to God with gratitude, which should result in alleviating anyone from the harshness of worry, fear, and stress. If you don't reflect on that, though, then it's every day you're on your own. Let's see how how far you can get up in your spiritual fighting. And some days are great and some days are, are not so great. But when you reflect on the foundation, the gratitude will then naturally, organically, come out. But if someone simply prays expecting this and that from God, treating him like their own Santa Claus, their anxiety will not dissipate. You know why? Because they are still trusting in themselves with that kind of prayer. That I know what is right for me and I know what will solve all my worry and anxiety and so I'm going to pray to this quote-unquote God out there to fix all my problems. I know what I need. But one who prays in gratitude knows that God is actually in control. We call that sovereign over all their lives. And that no matter what happens, God works all things together for the good of those who love him, Romans 8. So Paul is saying, don't worry, be prayerful. Don't be anxious, be prayerful. Some of you think you should be relieved from worry because you just perhaps close your eyes and you say several words and you feel like it's bouncing off the walls or hitting the ceiling. But Paul's command is tempered by this critical realization that there's a certain way to approach God with prayer and that's with humility, that's with a thankful heart and attitude, that it's not fix my problem or do this for me, but humbly asking God for help. And so I I wrote down just kind of even an example of a prayer to even pray, God, I, I don't really understand why I'm going through this bout with worry. I don't understand why you're allowing me to be tested this way. I don't understand why I have so much worry about my future, but I trust that you're good, and I know that I can trust in you for all things because the Bible tells me so. So Father, help me not to worry and to just trust that you are in control. It's not, um, I know this in my mind, I know that this is true, and so I'm just gonna pretend that I don't have worry or anxiety. No, owning up to it and saying, God, I have fear, I have anxiety, help me. Not to just remain in this place. That kind of prayer is much different than, okay, God, glad you're awake. I need you to fix these 14 things by noon. Okay, thanks. I'll talk to you next time. And obviously that is a caricature of how we pray, but perhaps for you it's a subtler version of that kind of prayer. Perhaps it's more like, God, I trust you, but I'll trust you way more if you answer me with certain results in a certain way, in a certain time frame. I'll be more confident to pray if you answer me the way I expect or simply desire. That kind of praying doesn't seem to drive away anxiety, but potentially sets you up for more anxiety because you'll constantly try to box God in. And God can't be limited to your feeble thoughts of how he should answer your prayer. Or our lives will be disastrous and the world would would implode on itself if God answered every prayer in the affirmative of our wayward thoughts and desires. So we cannot try to box God in. It will create more anxiety to say, why isn't God answering me the way I want him to? I must be doing something wrong. And you get even more anxious. Or perhaps I haven't done this spiritual discipline the correct way and I have to look at another person and kind of follow their pattern in order to get and receive. That would make anyone more anxious. Rather, friends, we need God to be God, to drive out our anxiety by praying with thanksgiving and an acknowledgement that he is in control. God, you are God. Help me to view you as you are. Be magnified 
so that I can see the details more and more and more and not create a designer God, a God that I want to create in my own imagination. And so strive to pray with this type of attitude. But does that mean we don't get specific for prayers? Well, let's finish the verse. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, let your requests be made known to God. Everything. Paul is saying God can handle it all. Jerry Bridges, the, the late uh, navigator's hero and a wonderful Bible-centered, gospel-centered man, he, he, he said this, and, and I'll quote him, that I think is really helpful for us. He said, Our worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace, and your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Let me say it again. Our worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Think about this when you're fighting sin. Think about this when you're sad. Think about this when you had, quote unquote, a great day. Think about this when you are filled with anxious thoughts. Because we are constantly in need of God, and he is perfectly capable of handling everything, your weakness, your quote-unquote strength, your quote-unquote good or bad days. He can handle all of your supplications. And so petition, Paul says, pray, prayer with petition or supplication is simply stating that you're going before God with humble requests. Now, you know me, I love the medieval period and kind of the kings and queens and King Arthur and all that. Well, in the days of kings, a servant would come before the king, not with a demand, and sometimes a line goes out the castle door because people come with so many requests. They don't come and say, all right, finally I'm here, now you're going to give me what I demand, but it's always with a humble request for aid and help. Now, you might say, well, he wrote, Paul wrote this a long time ago. And things are a lot more stressful in today's day. I mean, if Apostle Paul had an iPhone, he would be a lot more anxious. But do you know where Paul was when he wrote this? He was in jail. He was in jail because he followed Christus, the Christ, and proclaimed his good news. And to the ones in Philippi, they were undergoing constant persecution about their faith. It wasn't just Paul. It was those in that congregation also. They would be beaten, sometimes killed, ridiculed, and shown widespread prejudice against them for simply being a follower of Jesus Christ. And if anything, it would be understandable if they were the ones worrying and filled with anxiety, right? Sure, we can be anxious about a job. We get it. You can be anxious about a grade a living situation, and so forth. But they were probably like, are we going to be alive next week? But Paul says, don't go there. There is no room for anxiety. Paul is saying we must be resolved to say over and over again, rejoice, and that also in gratitude there isn't any room for anxiety. And he's saying, just pray to God with a thankful heart. I'm doing that in my cold cell right now, he's saying. Pray continually, as he states elsewhere, not just when things are rough and tough. Pray with an obedient heart that is trusting in the creator of the universe. That is the only way Paul can get through what he had to get through. Do this, Paul says, and you will flee your anxiety. I heard over the years that anxiety has surpassed depression as the leading clinical mental illness in America and even on college campuses. It's the number one mental health problem. But anxiety doesn't just deal with the present tense worries of the day, but it's perpetually obsessed with things coming at them in the future or even the unknown. And if you've talked to anyone who struggles with anxiety, including myself, it could be crippling to many. So why do you think Americans struggle with worry and anxiety like presumably many people do in this room? And of course, it's contextually different in a variety of situations across the world. 
But I think it's that instead of trusting in God to sustain people through their lives, which of course is filled with trials and difficulties, no one's going to undermine that. But what happens is that we start to trust in the idol of fill in the blank. Perhaps it's in our country the idol of safety, of success, or the idol of comfortable living, or full and unhindered health. And instead of trusting in a sovereign, all-powerful God that will oversee the care of his people's needs, we place our trust in our 401k options. We place our trust in our health care to make us feel safe, successful, secure. And of course, those things aren't bad in themselves. But what I'm talking about is the worship of them, the attempt to even replace God with those things. As I was getting prepared for this Sunday service this morning, I, was, I, I usually listen to uh, a, a favorite preacher or something like that just to kind of prepare my mind in totally different context and text. And, and he shared that kind of famous quote now of somebody who was uh, uh, addicted to fill in the blank, and for this particular case, it was gambling, a gambling addiction. And the pastor just said to him, you worshiped your way into that, now you have to worship your way out of that. And I think that's the same thing with what happens up here in the mind, is that we're so obsessed and saturated with the worries of life today and tomorrow and next year and so on and so on, that we start to worship false idols. And the only way to cure that is to worship your way out by fixing your mind and heart on God. Many believers are filled with anxiety because they try to be their own gods at critical moments, plain and simple, or they'll think, God, I'll do this for you if you can just do this in return. But the Apostle Paul knows that God is supreme, that God is far bigger than any of us meager humans. However, we try to play that spiritual game, and Paul is saying, don't do that. Stop playing that game. He knows the only way to get rid of anxiety is to constantly trust in the Lord. But then we say, how do you practically do that? He says, pray with gratitude, but pray specifically with supplications and petitions. And some might think, well, most people haven't experienced what I experienced here in this room, and that's why I have a greater right to anxiety. Well, you're right. Many haven't experienced what some of you experienced here, but I know that Paul isn't commanding to to don't worry, don't be anxious, only to select few that have gone through the ringer. But Paul is addressing this to everyone in the church of Philippi. That must mean young children all the way to the oldest congregate member. He knows not only from experience, but that the only way to get rid of anxiety is, looked, is to look to the one who could deliver you from that pit, and that's Christ alone. Now, you might also be saying, but I do pray all the time, Robin. I pray every morning, I pray every night, before meals. But again, how are you praying? Are you praying with unrelenting trust? Are you praying with thanksgiving? If not, you're praying with insecurity. You're praying not out of love and trust for God, but you're praying because of fear for what might come later on. But let me reassure you all, that's me too. <laughs> we all struggle with this. We're prone to pray this way, either because of lack of trust or selfishness or trying to achieve our own agendas. We all struggle with what I just mentioned there, praying without trust, praying without thanksgiving, praying for selfish needs. But because of the gospel, this good news that Paul would later give his own life for. God can grant us this attitude of trust and thanksgiving as long as we just present the request to him alone through faith alone. And the quote never gets old. We're not only justified by faith alone, we're also sanctified, the reformers reminded us. Sanctified meaning conformed to his image by faith alone also. Justified by faith alone, but also sanctified by faith alone. And what is faith? It is just this pure childlike trust. 
So friends, pray with faith that is rooted in trust, not in ourselves, but in our King and Lord. So instead of reciting the popular slogan or melody that you're probably really wanting to sing out loud right now, don't worry, be happy. No, Paul is essentially saying, don't worry, be prayerful. And then if we live by this, then it'll lead to the second point. Number two, the source is the peace of God. And uh, and I'll spend less time as the points go on. But verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So again, number two, the source is the peace of God. This is what drives, helps to drive away the pit of anxiety. So let's say you're buying into this. You're saying, okay, pray and offer requests unto God with thanksgiving. Don't worry. Well, then what happens? We'll say you accidentally drink poison. You panic, don't call me, you should call 911. You panic and you call maybe 911 or a doctor, and the doctor says, come immediately to my office, we're gonna shoot you up with an antidote, we know exactly what to give you, and that will take care of the poison, but if you don't act, there's no guarantees. And so you rush over, he takes the needle with the antidote and puts it into your vein, and voila, you're cured. Well, I think similarly, praying is like the needle and shot. It's not actually the substance that grants you the peace, but it's the vehicle that delivers the antidote for your anxiety. But what is the antidote that rids rids you of the poison? Okay, pray with gratitude, lift up uh, uh, petitions and supplications. Well, verse 7 again, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, or another translation, in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Nobody can understand how this works. It's a miracle. But it is yours if it is in faith. Paul is saying that when you pray to God and trust in him for all things, the result is the reminder of the antidote. It's the reminder that we already have the peace of God because of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. The peace of God is not referring to some inner bliss where you think, you know, I'm just floating on clouds right now. But rather, it's referring to the quality and character of God himself. That's the antidote. God himself is peace. And as one author puts it, quote, it refers to the tranquility, the tranquility of God's own eternal being, the peace which God himself has, the calm serenity that characterizes his very nature. End quote. And when we pray, this is fascinating, when we pray, we get to share it in his character. And when we pray more often, he's saying pray all the time, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, oh, we get more and more and more attuned to the character of God. You know, hundreds of books are published each year that try to answer the question, how to deal with anxiety and depression. I know because I'm at Barnes & Noble all the time, so sometimes I find a chair that's next to a section and I'm just amazed at how many books there are. Some can actually offer good practical help, but get this, none of the secular books out there can offer the peace of God. In the secular world, they can give you really helpful reminders and Things that you could do like exercise more or eat better or get healthy, that could affect your mood and your mind and even outward depression or anxiety, but none of these things can offer the peace of God. This comes by being, quote, unquote, in Christ Jesus, as it says there in verse 7. In Christ Jesus, United to him. Now, when believers receive the peace of God, it is something that is unexplainable. Has anyone asked you, what is the peace of God like? Or why do you think you have the peace of God? Or why are you in this state of peace? I, I, I'm not a Christian. I'm asking you, Robin, what is it? Can you explain it? We'll fumble with our words. It's unexplainable. It's not something easily articulated. We could start to explain, but that person, it, it, it's like a foreign language to them. It's something so marvelously mysterious yet available to his own children. And it's perfectly understandable to say, I I can't really explain it, but I know that if you place your trust in my Savior, in my God, you will experience this, you will receive this, and you will also tell your friends that do not believe 
in fumbled words and ways to say it is just a mysterious thing. And so reread the end of verse 7. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds from constant worry and anxiety. The Greek word used for guard, I love this, is a verb used militarily 2,000 years ago when describing a garrison or a group of soldiers that guards the walls of a city from attack. This is what guards your mind and your heart. It's the same with our hearts and minds. When we trust and pray to God, he grants us the peace of God, which then protects us from the attack of fear, anxiety, and worry. And what a promise that is. I'll get to application in a moment, but I, I love being in a church and someone calling me right, right before the service and saying, I, I could tell there was some anxiety in his or her tone. And she said, can, can you just pray? And I said, let's pray right now about an upcoming surgery and so forth. And, and, and so on. And that's exactly what we do. It's not denying that we ever get fearful or anxious, but saying, God, what can I do? I'm just going to at least stop and pray. And may I learn and be reminded again of the peace of God because I am in Christ Jesus. Finally, the final heading is number three, a new pattern of thinking and living. This is what comes out of this practice. A new pattern of thinking and living. I'm not going to unpack every phrase here, but listen to verse 8 and 9 again. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. There it is again. He truly gives us the motive and reason to think and live differently. We are a new creation. We still struggle with besetting sins. We still struggle with fear and anxiety and worry. But there is a new pattern of thinking and living because we are a new creation. And when a person realizes this, you feel such a weight come off of them. They realize that Christianity is not simply being more religious than the next person but it's receiving reconciliation with God through Christ that grants us inner peace that we can't help but want to grow in what he wants us to grow in, that whatever is true, honorable, noble, right, or pure, it's not something we simply have to do anymore. It's something we know we should cherish and seek out. And the heart that prays with verse 6 and 7 in full view will then in turn act upon verse 8 and 9. You see, the praying believer who prays out of gospel saturation learns to pray all things with gratitude and trust and does, does so in Christ, who then guarantees this inner peace that comes directly from the Prince of Peace so that now... Now in the new life, our minds can be fixated on things above whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is praiseworthy, right? A life saturated in prayer and granted peace is a life that seeks to be saturated in whatever is pure, honorable, right, and noble. And so what a needed, gentle correction this is for you and me today. That God forgive us of all our prayerlessness. Forgive us for not being fixated on the things on all these things because we care not to pray and live in gratitude. Forgive us for not thinking of these things above, setting our mind to them. Oh, and God, forgive me for doing the ex exact opposite of whatever is not true, whatever is not righteous, whatever is not honorable. And you confess this and confess this in this gentle correction from God's word. And forgive us because we have not lived out these verses, verse 6 through 8, that we forget to live out our con convictions as we're told to do. Verse 9, to put all these things that we have learned, gospel and its implications, Paul is saying, into practice. Friends, may we not let our fellowship with God be hindered, as we prayed earlier, because we disregard this. But as we repent, as we live out this in faith, let us live in the center of God's peace, as it says at the end of verse 9, and the peace of God will be with you. I'll just close with an encounter I had this past week. I met with a
pastor, colleague, and friend, and that I've known for a little bit now that he was diagnosed with a late stage cancer. It was the first time seeing him in person. I was a little bit actually anxious about what to say or how to act. And I saw him and we met eyes and we just embraced, big friendly hug, a guy that's been a great friend of me in recent years and supporter. And I I could almost tell for, for a split second even, there was a little bit of worry a little bit of fear and anxiety, and we hugged it out. But the rest of that hour with him, I could tell there was something different. Not an overwhelming fear and anxiety, but an overwhelming peace of God. And I know this man well enough to know that he prays. He's saturated in God's word. He loves the gospel. That is the only explanation I can give to why this, was, this guy wasn't on the floor weeping at such a young age in his life about what is to come, what might happen to his family, but to stand upright, why? Because he is fully cognizant of the character of God and his sovereignty, and that when he prays and when he is filled with the reminder of the peace of God, oh, he can wake up every day and encounter life And to remember, do not be anxious, but with everything in thanksgiving, lift it up, all your petitions, all your supplications, be reminded of the peace of God. And when that person or or somebody here who who says the same thing, you can be a witness to the light of Christ and someone, a a non-believer will come up to you and say, what is it? And he said, "It's it's something that transcends all understanding, but it could be offered to you too. And it could be, oh, that antidote to all your fear of life and what comes after life, the antidote to all your worry and anxiety. So let us, whatever situation that we're in, whatever situation, remember these words. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word that anchors us. We thank you that the gospel is not just you starting it with conversion and that we figure it out the rest of the way. Oh, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that reminds us of these wonderful truths, the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our waywardness, the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sin, the Holy Spirit that points us to Jesus Christ, the true peace of God, the Holy Spirit that lives in us, the Spirit of Christ, that lives in us, that directs us and points our affections to new things, to things above and not below. And so God, O Heavenly Father, we pray for the Spirit of Christ to do his work in us in such a very in our face reality that we can't deny. And that we would lift up our prayers and gratitude for one another and for ourselves and all supplications and petitions uh, so that we can point each other to Christ and the peace that we have. So Lord, we offer up our fears and our anxieties here this morning. And when we sing the song, when we remember uh, uh, what what the Son has done in communion, oh Lord, be glorified and praised. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.